Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the prophecy of Isaiah and chapter 53. Last week we were looking at the last section of chapter 52 and the first two sections of chapter 53. And we look this evening at the other two sections of chapter 53. But to give you a little background, I want to go back to read from verse 4. But for our study this evening, we'll be looking from verse 7 to the end of the chapter. Just a few things to be thinking about as we read these verses together. What is the nature of our Saviour's sufferings? These things are spelled out quite clearly on the surface of the text. What is the meaning of the silence of the servant here? Can you see the resurrection in the closing verses of this chapter? And what is the link between the sufferings of Jesus and his glory? Isaiah chapter 53, reading from verse 4. This is God's word. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Please do have your Bibles open at Isaiah chapter 53 as we spend some minutes looking at these verses together. Isaiah 53, page 792, and we'll be looking from verse 7 on. For some 28 years, Tim Keller was the main preacher in what was a new church in Manhattan, downtown New York City. The church, Redeemer Presbyterian, climbed from 50 attending in the early days to about 2,000 more recently. Tim may hold a few odd beliefs, but he stands four square on the gospel. He says, We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, 
we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Back in June last year, Tim Keller was diagnosed with cancer of the pancreas. It was caught early, but it's a very dangerous form of cancer. We come to consider Jesus' resurrection this evening, as well as his sufferings. When Tim was diagnosed, he had just started writing a book on the resurrection. And these are his own words. It really happened. The resurrection. There is no historically plausible alternate explanation for the birth of the Christian church than the resurrection, the real physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. As, and as I was working on that, he says, I was saying this really happened. And if this really happened, I'm going to be okay. And so is Kathy, his wife. We're all going to be okay. So that's how we dealt with the fears. That's a very practical, down-to-earth application of the truth that Jesus is risen from the dead and that therefore those who trust in him will also know new life from the dead. I hope as we look at this just now, that God will reveal similar practical truths to you. Not to put on a shelf or in a drawer and forget about, but truths to put in our pockets and take out and use every day. We come to the last two sections of Isaiah chapter 53 this evening. Last week, we considered the introduction to the major work of Jesus in the closing verses of Isaiah 52. And then in the first three verses of Isaiah 53, we looked at the surprising rejection of Jesus by his own people. And finally, we came to look at the remarkable substitution of Jesus for serious sinners in verses 4 to 6. And the idea of substitution is on the very surface of the text. Our first section this evening, from verse 7 to verse 9, has further notes of suffering. But the closing words of the chapter are tinged with glory, not just for Jesus, but for those who believe in him, whether our health is good or whether we're staring death in the face. We've had the servant humbled last week, humbled for others. And this evening we have the servant exalted. That's certainly what we have by the end of the chapter. And what happens to him affects all who trust in him. So let's look at verses 7 to 9 first. For this is the suffering. The suffering. In verse 7, we have Jesus' procession to the cross. In verse 8, we read of his execution. And in verse 9, we have his burial. The remarkable thing that this is pinpointed with such accurate detail 700 years before any of this began to happen. Verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. This is so clear and so plain and so striking. Those two words, oppressed and afflicted, sum up all that happened to Jesus before he was crucified. The various trials, legal and illegal, before the Jews, before Herod, and before Pilate, the Roman governor. The beatings, the mockings, the false charges, the insults, the crown of thorns, the path to the cross. 
Don't forget, this is the servant of the Lord. This is the one who is described in these terms earlier in Isaiah's prophecy. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's also known as the Lion of Judah. Yet how is he behaving here in verse 7? More like a lamb. And this takes us into Jesus' very mind. He could so easily have opened his mouth. He could have declared his complete innocence. He could have summoned 10,000 angels to destroy his enemies. But he chose not to. He decided to keep his claws sheathed. He kept his mouth closed. He walked willingly right into the jaws of death. If you know the book, C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, then the regal lion, Aslan, rises into view here. But Aslan does in that book, submitting himself to the jibes and the torture of the witch and her brood, who really should have not, no hand, no power over him. As far as he is concerned, Unlimited power, unused, devastating attack, restrained. But why? A lamb doesn't know it's going to be slaughtered. That's why it goes willingly. Jesus knew precisely the horror that was coming. A lamb cannot really pay for the sins of any human being. But another human can. One who is without blemish in the prime of life. One who is also God can pay for the sins not just of one person, but of a multitude. And he was silent because he was accepting the charges. The first Adam was guilty of blasphemy of saying, of thinking, that he could be God. He was guilty of treason too, disobeying God's one law. The second Adam, Jesus, was charged with blasphemy, making himself out to be God, and charged with treason, disobeying the laws of Rome. He was not guilty in any way, but he accepted the charges. In our place. He was silent before Pilate, silent before Herod. For you, believer, for me, his mouth was shut. That means salvation for us. Praise his name. Jesus' procession to the cross, verse 8, shows us his execution. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. This verse is hard to translate precisely. I think the ESV is slightly better than the the NIV. One change to the ESV clarifies the last line. He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the blow was due. Those last words slightly different. To whom the blow was due. And although the word death isn't mentioned here in verse 8, it's behind every phrase. Jesus was taken away and he didn't come back. He was cut off out of the land of the living. He was stricken. A death blow fell on the Lord of life. Jesus really died. His heart stopped beating. His blood began to separate, as happens when death comes. His brain showed no activity. Yet people did not understand why. 
many came to see a show and went away beating their breasts. But they thought little more of it. Many people have no idea why Jesus died. Even his own followers didn't grasp. He had to die for their sins. But that's the note that sounds here over and over again. He was cut off for the transgression, for the rebellion of my people, Isaiah says, to whom the blow was really due. Jesus was the loneliest man who ever breathed, utterly alone on the cross, with no arms of a loving father underneath him. He died so that none of us need ever face death alone, need ever know such a death ourselves. He died for my people, for his own sheep. For a definite number, no one can count. Not for everyone, without exception. Jesus warned about hell more than anyone else, because Jesus knew that hell is not empty. One of his own followers, Judas, ended up there. That's why we mustn't keep this to ourselves. Only faith in this death will say, and only we who believe have the message. Let's get it out. Yet the suffering doesn't end with the death. Look at verse 9. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. There has to be a burial. It's the lowest level to which Jesus descends. And as you can see here, he was marked out to be buried along with the criminals he died with, the dregs of society. But God steps in here. God counters the powers that be to fulfill what it says. Completely out of the blue, a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, bolder than any of Jesus' men, offers to bury Jesus in his own tomb, which becomes the site for the greatest miracle this world has seen, the resurrection of Jesus. Joseph gave his tomb. Whatever you have, give it to Jesus. And he will use it. After all, did he not give everything, including his body, to be buried? For you, believer. Where it says, though, about halfway through verse 9, or although, because, is actually better. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because... He had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. God brings the rich man forward because of who Jesus is. And we have at the end of the verse here the complete sinlessness of Jesus, which is recorded in so many places in the Bible. No sin in his outward actions, though he had done no violence. No sin in his heart, and therefore none from his lips. Nor was any deceit in his mouth. That's why he can pay for the sin of others. And one final thing from verse 9. It says literally in the second line, and with a rich man, in his deaths, plural. In other words, it wasn't just one death at Calvary on that middle cross. As Jesus bore all the sins of all his people, he died, he suffered the deaths, the hell that every one of his millions of people 
should have suffered. Is your death one of those he died that day? Was your sinful nature executed there so that the life you now lead is by the faith he has given you? As Paul asks quite pointedly, if when Jesus died for you, you died to sin, how can you live in it any longer? Verse 10 does begin a new section of this chapter, but the theme of suffering carries on a little longer. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And some people see here what they call a slaughterhouse theology. Some have even gone so far as to call this cosmic child abuse. They see God as being vengeful here, taking it out on his son. But such a view makes at least three mistakes. First of all, Jesus here is not some unwitting third party. Jesus is God on the cross. In the councils of eternity, he accepted this punishment as the only way to keep God's justice without sending all of us to hell where we deserve to go. Secondly, God is demonstrating his own love for us in crushing Jesus like this. As Charles Spurgeon, the well-known Baptist preacher, says, Can you think how overwhelming must have been the love of God toward the human race when he completed in act what Abraham, in tying Isaac to the altar, only did in intention? For well, the Bible tells us that the father never loved his son more than on the cross, but he loves sinners enough to put his own son through this. And thirdly, does it not show how deep and how wide is the guilt of our sin that it would take such a sacrifice? We are in a terrible situation. By nature. That can't be exaggerated. Nothing else will do except the death of this pure and perfect servant. Those who complain about what's going on at Calvary understand their sin so little. But with the second half of verse 10, the dark clouds start to lift and the first strains of what I want to call the glory can be heard again. The glory that was promised back at the end of chapter 52. Chapter 52, verse 13. So will he sprinkle many nations, or sorry, verse 13. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. We saw last week that verses 4 to 6 may be the very heart of this passage. But certainly verses 10 to 12 are the highlight, the high point. The one who died in such a graphic way, in such a public way, will live again. Just look at the rest of verse 10. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He will have offspring, seed. Although Jesus never had any genetic children, many will bear his likeness. He will take up the reins of the universe, the will the good pleasure of the Lord and everything he touches will bring success. And just as the word death 
isn't mentioned in verse 8, but it's full of Jesus' death. So the, the word resurrection is not mentioned here. But it is everywhere in these closing verses. Part of the pain of parenthood is having to leave our children behind when we die. Jesus here won't be deprived like that. He will see his spiritual children. His days will be to eternity. Everything he touches will prosper. James Tour, whom I mentioned in our prayer just a few minutes ago, that Jewish Christian, says this is the true prosperity gospel linked to the sufferings of Jesus. Jesus will suffer. Jesus will rise. Jesus will prosper. As Jesus says himself in Revelation chapter 1, he is the living one. He was dead. And behold, he is alive forever and ever. Indeed, through his death, he holds the keys of death and of hell. And what we're reading here, what we're studying here, is not something that man has made up. God gave Isaiah these words, as I say, 700 years before they came to pass. And just look how many times, even in this last section, Isaiah is still hammering home the message of the cross. As we've seen at the beginning of verse 10, God is punishing his own son. As verse 10 continues, God is offering up his son, though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering. Jesus is declaring guilty people righteous by taking our place. In verse 11, by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. And in verse 12, Jesus is treated as if he is a sinner. But he is being punished in the place of many sinners. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many. If someone complains about Jesus being a substitute on the cross, then that person must take that complaint to God himself, because this is God's plan from eternity to eternity. And if Jesus is not your substitute, what hope do you have for this life? Never mind the next one. Let's focus in on the glory here. If Jesus was dead and is alive forevermore, then we don't need any other to take over from him. His reign is eternal. Look at verse 11. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Again, we need a slight amendment here. Instead of after, it's probably better to read, Out of the suffering of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. And that's a lovely word, satisfied. It takes us back to the very beginning, with God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit standing back at creation and looking in pleasure at all he had made. Satisfied, no flaws, no gaps, no faults. In the same way, Jesus will be satisfied with what he sees. And of course, that presupposes the resurrection. He'll stand back and take pleasure in his redeemed people. No disappointment here. We may think so little of ourselves at times, and certainly we do fall short of our own standards, never mind God's standards. We may think that God is ashamed of us. It's not wrong 
to view our failings accurately. But Jesus isn't putting on a brave face here. Every person he died for will be there. No empty spaces. And he will look at you, believer, with perfect delight. He's doing something now. And he's going to do something in you and me then. Where he'll be able to say, there's no improvement needed. He, she, they gladden my heart. And the resurrection stamps what verse 12 says with a ring of victory. Looking at the, the last part of verse 12. No one takes Jesus' life from him. He pours it out willingly to death. As they say these days, he leaves it all on the field. He takes all that death can throw at him. And as the guiltless one, he emerges triumphant on the other side. He takes the sin of transgressors. He is numbered with the transgressors and he makes that sin his very own so that he can set us free, so that he can welcome us in. He bears the sin of many. For any of us, our own sin is enough to take us to death, to take us to hell forever. But this shows that he is not only man, but God, crucified in our place to bring us glory. And the last words of verse 12 show us his victory. He made intercession for the transgressors. He prayed for others on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And that work of intercession continues still. He presents his life, his death, his resurrection before his Father as our passport to glory. What other advocate do you need than this substitute, this Savior, this sovereign Jesus? Death itself is swallowed up in victory. Let me come finally to that question that I asked earlier on. How is the suffering linked, connected to the glory? It's quite clear here that glory comes after suffering. This section on Jesus' glory comes after three sections on Jesus' suffering. But I want to show you it's not just a time thing, just in the same way as Tuesday follows Monday. There's a close connection which shows how the suffering and the glory are related. The people of the day couldn't get this, but we need to. Look at the first part of verse 12. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Why can mighty ones, the great, the strong, people like kings even, Why can they share in Jesus' triumph? How can they become members of his kingdom? Read on. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. And that because is the strongest link there is in Hebrew. In other words, the suffering and the glory are tied inextricably together. The cross doesn't stop the crown coming. That's what many people think today. That's also what Jesus' disciples couldn't get their heads round. How could there be anything good come out of the cross? People think that suffering blots out glory. But the truth is, the cross brings in the crown. The cross produces the crown. That's why we rejoice in the cross. Jesus' suffering leads to forgiveness, to eternal life, to glory, 
for all who trust in him. So what truth should come first in the church? Although certainly quickly followed by the empty tomb, the cross, surely. Jesus came to glory by being crucified on a cross. And that's true for believers as well. Tim Keller and many other Christians have known our knowing temporary pain, even pain that leads to death. But that is no more a mistake than the cross of Jesus was. That is the pathway to resurrection, to eternal glory for those who hand their pain and hand their lives over unreservedly into the care, into the keeping of the risen Jesus. So don't be sidetracked from the cross in your worship, in your life, in your witness. So how does the cross of Jesus shape your life? Jesus' sufferings here as we've been considering them, Jesus' sufferings were unique. But didn't he tell us to take up a cross and follow him? There's no glory without a cross for Jesus and for us. And that means just the same for us as it did for him. Self-denial, suffering, rejection, even humiliation. It will be great to join in the praises of the Lamb that was slain, now upon his throne. But in this world, being a Christian will cost you in all kinds of ways. Otherwise, it's not following this Saviour. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And there's something in society today that doesn't want to keep commandments, that simply wants to break rules. But that's how you prove your love. The cross isn't there just to be marveled at. It's the measure of our sins. It's the mark of our sacrifice. It's there to be shouldered as you walk into this Easter week, as you walk into what God has in store for you in the future. If we are united with Jesus in his death, we will also be united with him in his resurrection. As with Jesus, only those who bear the cross are entitled to wear the crown. Let's bow before God together. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for such a detailed picture of Jesus' cross so many centuries before it even happened. We do pray that you would help us to be thinking more about the cross, the cross where Jesus died, what it meant for him to die, and the cross that he calls believers to take up, because that is the path to glory. Help us not to shrink from the cross, but to realise that the old nature of every believer is nailed there, so that you by your Spirit may give us the strength to bear whatever you want in our lives. And Father, this life can give us wounds, but we will end up looking at the wounds of our Saviour. May we believe that our momentary troubles in this world are working for us an eternal glory. Father, if any watching this service this evening are still strangers to this, then we pray that you would help such to confront our sin, to hate that sin that sent Jesus to the cross and to believe that Jesus has done all this to take that sin away 
to know that if we believe in him, then we too are on a path to glory. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.